How's everybody doing? Okay. <laughs> some, some excellence, some heavy sighing. <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started. This is your last session before the final plenary, correct? Cool. You are, as you can see, in trauma-informed care. And my name is Erin. This is Casey. We're from Devereaux. How many of you guys have heard of Devereaux Advanced Behavioral Health? Is it because you've had kids placed in one of our residential facilities? OK, cool. So Devereaux, I'll just give you a quick overview. Devereaux is a national organization that does lots and lots of things, mostly with children, mostly behavioral health and mental health. We are in 11 states, and we do many, many, many things here in the state of Florida. Casey and I are part of our Delta programming. Has anybody heard of that? That is specific to working with individuals who've been sexually exploited or trafficked. With that population, we have a treatment track at our Vieira campus, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. We have specialized foster care for our trafficked youth, and we also have outpatient programming, which is what Casey and I are most involved in in our day-to-day -day work. Um, we have therapy, case management, training, parent coaching, things of that nature, all related to trafficking and exploitation, which is where sort of this training comes from, but we're not focusing on that today. We're just really going to focus on what is trauma and, and how do we meet people where they're at. If things come up that you guys have questions about, feel free to interject. Um, we are not going to be thrown off by a, a hand raise. Do you have a question? <laughs> so I might not be able to answer all of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> But we have, um, we have, how many facilities do we have? Two major facilities. We have, a, we have a SIP, which is in Orlando, and we have the Intensive Residential Treatment Center in Vieira, Brevard County. And then we have outpatient programming, foster care, sort of throughout the state. We've got a, a hub in South Florida, which is Broward County, I believe, Lee County, we have specialized foster care and family care, which is specific to individuals with um, developmental delays and intellectual developmental delays. We have case management programs in Hillsboro and Orange, and we have foster care and outpatient in Volusia and Osceola Orange Seminole. And we have a, a residential, another residential program in Winter Park, which is specific for individuals with in, uh, developmental delays as well. I'm, I'm sure I missed something major, but <laughs> that's, that's a little bit of a, a Devereaux overview for you. So this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about attachment. What is trauma and its effects on the brain and body? We are going to talk about common triggers and trauma reactions. And then we're going to talk about trauma-informed care, which is the title of our, our presentation this morning. Um, Casey and I both have been working with individuals for many years now. The last several years, I would say, for each of us has really been focused on individuals with extreme sexual trauma, and so that's kind of where we're coming from. We're just going to go back and forth today, so we're going to just both stand up here the whole time. <laughs> All right, so to really understand trauma and its effects, I think it's important to also understand attachment. And what we know is attachment is vital. Positive attachment is what directs a young person to become a healthy, functioning adult. So that bond from, and we even know this now when a, a baby is placed in the NICU, that for that parent to be able to touch, physical touch, that attachment is incredibly important for healthy brain development, for um, a healthy immune system development. Um, holistically, attachment is, is the foundation for the child. So there have been four major attachment styles identified, secure, ambivalent, avoidant, and disorganized. With secure attachment, this is what we would love for every child to experience, where you have caregivers who are attentive, who encourage independence, but they're that foundation where the child can run and play, but come back. 
And what we see is as that child grows into a young adult, you have the healthy relationships. They can form trust with other people. They tend to have positive self-esteem. They're able to fail, but also understand that that's part of getting to success. So they just have a really healthy sense of self. With ambivalent attachment, this is where <clears throat> the parent is ambivalent emotionally. It could be because of a mental health issue. It could be because of an addiction. It could be because the parent has their own trauma history and they're not really sure how to connect with that young person. So what we see is that the child um, doesn't really trust anyone. Um, they're distressed when the parents leave but when the parent returns, it's not, the, the child's not, oh, you know, you're back. The, the child doesn't really trust that attachment, like you're physically here, but are you emotionally available? So what happens as a young person grows into a young adult, they are reluctant to trust others. They don't form those relationships easily. Um, and when they don't have that person who is consistently with them, um, they can become what we would think overly upset. So when that first breakup happens or they perceive that person has rejected them, it could be um, very disconcerting for that young person. Avoidant attachment, again, this is where the parent just really isn't available emotionally. They might be there physically, but they're not responding to the child. This is what we think of with neglect. Um, the, the parent is there, but again, for whatever reason, whether it's mental health issues, addiction issues, um, they are just not available for the child. So the child learns, I can cry, but what's the point? I can go ask for help, but I'm not gonna get it. Um, so then as they grow into young adults, they don't have that trusting relationship. They think, I can do everything myself. They don't really see the value in emotional relationships. So you could be working with a young person and you, you know, bring them a gift and they're like, okay. And you think, well, you didn't even say thank you and you've been talking about this for months and you, know, you found that perfect special thing and they're just like, eh. It's not that they don't appreciate it, it's just they don't know how to respond in what we would think would be the quote unquote appropriate way to respond to that because they don't know what that looks like. Um, not to say they can't learn those things, but that's their foundation where they say emotional availability just really isn't beneficial. It's not something that um, is going to help me meet my immediate needs. And then disorganized attachment is what we have when there's abuse by the caregiver. So the child, you know, their source of comfort is also the source of their abuse. And that is where essentially complex trauma comes from that we're gonna talk about. Um, with that, the, um, the young person does not know what the true foundation for relationship is. So they really don't know how to manage themselves. They have um, poor emotional regulation skills. They, they don't know, um, you know, I'm upset, but it goes from like zero to 100, like that. We think, oh, they're overreacting. Um, again, that comes from their source of comfort was also their source of abuse. So they don't trust others, they don't trust themselves, they don't really know what um, relationships should look like and how they should respond in those relationships. So the definition of trauma that we use is extreme stress that overwhelms somebody's ability to cope. <clears throat> and we know that these are overwhelming experiences that lead to biologically driven survival responses. We also know that it's not necessarily a specific event that determines whether something's traumatic or not, but there's all sorts of things that play into that. It's somebody's life experience up into that event, whether they've had previous traumatic experiences, what sort of coping mechanisms they have in place. Just to give you guys a silly example, if, if let's say Casey and I were driving in a car together, which we actually do sometimes, and um, we got into a really bad car accident and we, we got out of the car, it, it's very possible that Casey is just thinking, I gotta call my insurance, I'm gonna need to get a rental. Like She's not even thinking about what just happened and how horrible it was, but me sitting in a different seat than her saw something different, or because I've been in 25 car accidents already, this 26th one 
tells me that I should not be ever getting in a car again, right? It was a much more traumatic experience for me than for her because we have different life experience, because we have to, she's got great coping skills, I don't, I do not know how to handle this. So there's lots of different reasons why some, somebody might experience something very similar and not have the same reaction as the person maybe sitting right next to them that experienced the same sort of thing. Those biologically driven um, responses are what we, we probably are all pretty aware of, the fight, flight, or freeze. And again, this is not something that we take time to think about, right? We are not um, walking down the street and somebody pulls a gun on us and we think, oh, should I run? Should I scream? Should I fight? Should I stand here because I don't know? It's automatic, right? And we're not thinking about anything else either. We're not like, oh, there's a guy, uh, what am I gonna make for dinner tonight, right? It's automatic, it's very fast moving, and um, when that danger is gone, the response is gone. Um, and some of us have a, a pretty regular response that's always maybe flight, that's what works for us. There's, there's um, biological things that happen where blood rushes to the hands and the feet to actually get you out of a situation. Um, we, maybe some of you have worked with young people who constantly run from their placement. Biologically driven response sometimes. <clears throat> um, and most of us think, gosh, I wouldn't want to freeze in a very dangerous situation, but we have no control over that, right? Um, and we, we think, oh my gosh, why don't you get out of that situation? Has anybody ever watched a, a horror film before? <laughs> thought, why are you going upstairs? Um, anyways, that's a random thought from me. Watch this, uh, this short clip. Maybe you've seen this before. <laughs> okay. I'm sure you're wondering, why in the world did you just show us that? And the reason that I think that is helpful in this conversation is because all of you are sitting in this hotel. You're watching something on a screen that you know is on a screen. It's not actually in the room, right? And I still saw lots of people jumping because we have this automatic response to things that jump out and that are scary. And we cannot control them. Some of you didn't jump, so you've got maybe a different sort of response to stressors. Um, but I think that's just a good reminder, right? You're, you're sitting in your house, you're watching television, and something still makes you scream because we have this automatic response. We also have different types of trauma. Um, there's acute trauma, complex trauma, and chronic trauma. So acute trauma would be typically like a one-time experience, maybe something like a car accident. Um, chronic trauma would be, it could be something that's happening over and over again, like childhood abuse. But complex trauma is what we typically are dealing with when we're with the individuals we work with, and I'm sure a lot of you are as well. This is many different types of trauma, trauma that never you feel like you never can get out of. Um, maybe it is just intergenerational. Maybe it is something that has been happening and you don't even know there's anything different in life. That you've, you've lived in trauma your whole life. Um, I've heard people talk about <clears throat> the difference between complex trauma and non-complex trauma being when you have a trauma, a lot of times there's life before that event and life after that event. And when somebody experiences complex trauma, there's no normal to go back to because your whole before that event was all trauma. And sometimes this results in the inability to detect danger cues, a lot of times. Another silly example for you. If I was walking down a sidewalk and just minding my own business and out of nowhere something knocked me down, that would be really strange because I didn't see what it was, it's never happened before, I have no context where to put that experience. But it's also probably not gonna change my life a whole lot because it's never happened before and I have no reason to think it's gonna happen again. But if I keep walking and something knocks me down again and again, I may start to change the way I view the world because I'm looking out for danger now. I might start changing my stance, the way I walk. If it just keeps happening over and over and over again, it becomes my life. It's not something I'm looking out for anymore. It's something that I'm just expecting. And again, if you think about some of the young people that you work with, they may, be in a place where they don't even recognize if something's dangerous anymore because it's so common and such a part of their life 
that they're not looking out for what's dangerous. They're maybe even running to what you would think is dangerous. Has anybody experienced that before with young people you work with? Okay. So we wanna show you a clip from a video, Remembering Trauma. <clears throat> it's much longer than what we're gonna show you, but it, I think it gives a good, a good picture, and it's from a school perspective, um, but hopefully is, is helpful, and then we'll, we'll keep going after this. I was working with paramedics and we got to talking and I asked one of them what the most difficult part of the job was and his answer was the kids. And he told me a story about a call that he had responded to about a 13 year old boy that had been pretty badly, severely hurt. And he picked the boy up, they picked the boy up from the home and the boy's father had beaten him pretty severely and as they were transporting him to the hospital, he said to the boy, what, what happened, why did your father do this? And the boy said, it's Tuesday. And that was it. It can be anything, it doesn't matter what it is. You'd never know what you're walking into, there is no predictability and it just becomes part of everyday life. And if something becomes part of everyday life like that, it just changes the way that you, that you view the world and you no longer necessarily even think of it as a traumatic event, it's just life. So part of our challenge is to help people see that there can be a different life. I don't understand what you would think. Tell me exactly what happened. Nothing. Nothing? Doesn't look like nothing. You know I have to submit a report to the judge. Who are you texting? Texting a friend. What do you care? Let me see your phone. I'm not gonna let you see my phone. It's my phone. I don't want to violate you, Manny, but this doesn't look good. What were you thinking? Are you stupid or something? Let me see your phone. Yo, Mario, what's up? Hey, man, why don't you leave her alone? I was thinking... I gotta do something. Well, you sure did something. A lot of times you throw up in really in two different worlds simultaneously. One world in which there are rules and laws that govern behavior and what you should and shouldn't do. But then they grow up in another world where there is violence in the home and violence on the street. And that's just the way that things are and you have to toughen up. The challenge for them is negotiating when do you apply which set of rules. Hey, she doesn't want to talk to you, man. She doesn't want to talk to you. you what are you going to do about it, huh? Oh my God! No! No! Stop it! Stop it! You're off Leave me alone, man! No! No! Hey, stop it! Stop it! Because oftentimes they grow up in these environments, they don't necessarily have a sense of other ways of being. I so badly want to say, oh, you need to stop drinking, you need to stop smoking, stop cutting, stop fighting. But we have to first back up a little bit and say, why? Why is this person doing what they're doing? Because on some level, what they're doing is working. Otherwise, they wouldn't be doing it. in creating this film was to initially provide education and support to providers across a range of different child-serving settings, so including mental health, child welfare, juvenile justice, and school-based settings. 
and in providing the support so that providers could more fully understand how, com how trauma looks and how it can lead to these different complex reactions among youth and also to hopefully um, minimize that potential for misdiagnosis or mislabeling that may often occur. Um, secondly, we wanted to offer support to family members and caregivers in understanding how trauma can look and how it can look very complex and to really support them in advocating for um, their own needs and their own services for, for, for their youth or for themselves. Children and adolescents who have experienced chronic or multiple traumas, beginning at an early age and often at the hands of their caregivers, really often have a range of difficulties, a range of significant difficulties that cut across areas of functioning and impairment and across different diagnoses, and this is often referred to as complex trauma. Unfortunately, the challenge is that there is no one diagnosis to identify kids who have been complexly traumatized and who have complex trauma symptoms. Trauma doesn't just look like one thing, but it looks like a lot of different things, and it may lead to a range of different labels that are not connected to trauma. And so what this means is that a lot of the youth that are served often do receive multiple diagnoses. I think of trauma as the great imitator. The effects of trauma can look like depression, they can look like ADHD, they can look like bipolar disorder, in some cases they can even look like schizophrenia. We may see someone who comes in with depression and anxiety and panic attacks and mood swings and some aggression and you could give each of those behaviors a different diagnosis or you could say what explains all of it. And especially in children, maybe all of those things are explained by a trauma history. So uh, the term complex trauma has been used to try to, to get a handle of this, that trauma is not just one simple little thing, it's not one diagnosis, but it can involve so many other things. It can involve uh, people's relationships, it can involve being aggressive, it can involve being very depressed. A whole bunch of different ways that are much larger than one particular diagnosis. What I often see in my work is that children who have experienced trauma um, are often misdiagnosed with um, an autism spectrum disorder, um, ADHD, and a lot of it has to do with um, the fact that sometimes uh, there isn't uh, a comprehensive enough history taken related to the child's experiences. Having experienced trauma uh, can also look like um, uh, problems in development or behavioral problems. I think there is sometimes uh, a, like a poor understanding of maybe the role of genetics. I mean, I think people um, might think that, well, because the parents were a certain way, maybe the child is headed that way, and it's more complicated than that, and, and, and the environment has a great deal to do with um, the presentation that you, you see in children. Part of our challenge is to look at these problematic or difficult behaviors as coping responses, really. They're representing the child's best effort at coping with a very difficult life circumstance. And in many ways, these responses are adaptive. So, for example, if you take an adolescent that's grown up with a lot of community violence, he may physically assault a peer at school for threatening him or disrespecting him. And while doing that might get him suspended or kicked out or some sort of criminal consequence, he's also earned respect from his peers and he's also proven that you can't mess with him. So if you grow up in an environment where violence is the norm and it's just part of everyday life, you no longer start to think about that as as unusual. So if somebody says to you, have you ever been physically abused? Well, no, I'm hit every day. told you, I don't want my baby around anyone who's violent. It was just something stupid. I don't even know what happened. I would never hurt our baby. How am I supposed to trust you? Go clean yourself up. Hey! 
me. Give me some water. You hear me talking to you, boy? I said give me some water. Hurry up. Don't make me get up. Pretty powerful, huh? So it's, it's easy to look at Manny and say, oh, this is why he attacked that peer. Um, this is part of a much longer video. It's actually about 30 minutes. Um, obviously, we didn't want to take up your whole time showing that. But there are multiple things that happen in Manny's life when he's very young that contribute to the behaviors that you saw just in that one instance where he got in a fight with that guy. So when we think about the impact of complex trauma, attachment and relationships, he obviously has someone in his life who he cares about very much. They have a child together, but there's that sense of mistrust by her. How can you, how can I trust you won't harm our child if you don't even know why you, you know, attacked this guy? What's going to happen? Um, the emotional responses. <clears throat> so what you don't see in this clip is when Manny was young, he witnessed his sister being sexually assaulted. So obviously when he saw this guy harassing his girlfriend, he had that overreaction. What are you gonna do about it? Well, I'm gonna show you what I'm gonna do about it. That's very typical of what we see in young people where you think um, someone skipped you in the lunch line so you punch them in the face. Like we don't actually get that connection. Um, it's that emotional overreaction. We call it with complex trauma, they go into reactive. And it's the emotional part of the brain that's being activated. So everything is an emotional response. The alternate to that is avoidance. I have these strong emotional reactions. I don't want to show emotion, so I'm going to stuff everything. So that's the, the kid who has the walls 10 feet high and 10 feet thick that you think you just can't get them to talk about anything. Um, dissociation could be part of it, where you kind of see that blank stare. We all do this on some level. I've driven by exits a number of times and think, oh, I should have turned there, I should have gotten off there. Like we're thinking about things going on, we kind of dissociate, that's a very light level. But for someone who's experienced complex trauma, dissociation may be that coping skill. So they just kind of check out of any stressful emotional situation and they go to a place for them that is safe. So when you see a young person who just has that blank stare um, and they're able to kind of come back to reality, ask them about it. Where were you just now? It looked like you were somewhere else. Where, what were you thinking about? What were you feeling? Um, those are some things that, and they may not even know. They may say, I, I don't know, I was just, you know, kind of blanked out for a second. Um, that's a possibility as well. Um, obviously, the behaviors, something that we just saw um, with Manny. The thinking and learning, um, we're gonna talk more about the brain and how it's impacted, but a young person, bless you, a young person who consistently is in that fight, flight, or freeze is not going to take in new information, so it's going to be hard for them to learn new information. And like I said, they're in that emotional brain, that constant reactivity, awareness, self-preservation, so thinking is probably not gonna be very clear. Obviously, we know too, teenagers aren't great at planning and thinking. You ask any teenager, why'd you do that? What's their response? I don't know. Right, so that's the teenage brain in general. When you add trauma on top of that, it makes thinking what we think, thinking clearly, really much more difficult. Um, Self-concept and future orientation, there is none. 
Like Aaron said, with complex trauma, there is no normal to go back to. They don't know what their self-concept is or what it should be, and they're definitely not thinking about their future. They're thinking about today, they're thinking about survival. Sometimes it's even, where's my next meal coming from? Um, so ask them what they wanna do after high school and they're, they have no clue. It's like, how is hi after high school gonna be any different than what I'm experiencing now? Um, and then the physical health, the body and the brain. And have any of you heard of ACEs, Adverse Childhood Experiences? I see some nods, awesome. So you have this in your handout, um, and feel free to make copies of this if you wish, but what, um, we do this with the individuals that we serve, we ask them to complete this. Um, but what we also encourage you to do is to take a moment and look at the questions for yourself. And think about, okay, maybe I've experienced some of those things, and because I have experienced some of those things, how might I respond to an individual who's also experienced those things? Um, because what we know is teenagers are really good at recognizing um, kind of what our buttons are. And so they're going to recognize when we respond in a certain way, oh, you know, I got that response, so I'm gonna do it again. Also, what we know about young people um, is negative attention is better than no attention. So um, when they get that response that, I can't believe you did this, or why did you do this, or they're in trouble, or you know something's going on, they know they've gotten a response. And they're seeking that attention. They're seeking that connection. Um, so we need to recognize, even for ourselves, okay, what on here have I experienced that may be difficult for me? Um, we're also gonna talk about triggers. What could be a trigger for me? And how am I going to manage my interactions with that young person? Some common trauma reactions. Again, that alarm system, that fight, flight, or freeze. Um, you know, once it's on high alert, it stays on high alert. So, you know, we walk outside, we see a stick in the grass, we think it's a snake, we jump, and we're like, oh, it's just a stick. We go on about our day. But if our alarm system is always operating at full capacity, then we're not able to say, oh, it's just a stick. Because now, every place we step, we're looking. We're surveying. So it's, it's you know, um, threat level 10, everything we see now. Um, again, the stress response. How many of you have worked with young people that go from zero to 60 just like that? Because they, she looked at me. Oh, okay. So that's why there is, you know, a 10 person brawl in the lunchroom, got it, okay. Um, but that could be, again, that stress response that just reacting to the situation. And then once they get there, it's, they have difficulty calming back down. Um, the impulsivity, again, reacting, um, they may feel they're going crazy. Especially with complex trauma, if they don't know what quote unquote normal is, then they think, I have these responses, I don't know why. Like Manny said, I, I don't know why I hit that guy. I don't know what happened. Um, he could very well feel like he's going crazy. Like why can't I control myself like other people do? Um, it could lead to numbing, where it's too much to feel anything, so they just work all the time trying not to feel anything. Again, difficulty concentrating and trouble regulating the body. You know, we can feel angry, and it's like, okay, I need to take some deep breaths, I'm gonna go to a quiet place, or you know, I'm going to do some things because I don't want to you know, say something I'm going to regret. Um, young people with complex trauma have a very difficult time doing that. And this next video we're going to show um, just illustrates a little bit about what can go on in the brain when um, a traumatic event happens to explain why it can be a little difficult to do that. So as you can see, there's a lot that's going on in the brain. Um, a couple things I wanted to point out on this slide is um, they're not going to trust us as the professionals, why should they? Um, so we can get caught in the trap of, I know I'm a good person, I'm not going to you know, do anything that's going to intentionally harm you, you can trust me. Um, but they're not, and they're probably going to do everything they can to push us away to see how far we'll go to stay. 
Um, so that's really important to understand that as well. And also um, with trauma, there's disruptions of memory. So you could say, well, remember I told you that? And they're like, no, I don't. I don't remember anything about that. We can get really frustrated. Um, so here's Dr. Campbell again, who's going to talk about how trauma impacts memory. You may have noticed that she's sort of talking to law enforcement. That was a, a video that was created for ro roll call um, with regards to sexual assault. Because a lot of times we come to people who've experienced something traumatic and say, what happened? Start at the beginning, you know, give us every detail, and that's just not how the brain works. But then what happens is, when somebody can't do that, we think they're lying, right? And our brain just doesn't work that way. Um, as a side note, I counted 38 people in here, and we brought 40 handouts, so everybody should have one. <laughs> if you have an extra one at your table, maybe you can hold it up and somebody else can grab it. Um, because these next couple of slides are just an overview of one of the handouts that's in that packet from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. They're talking about core concepts for understanding traumatic, uh, traumatic stress responses in childhood. So because it's a handout, and if you don't get, have one and want one, just let us know, we can email it to you. There is a lot of information on the handout, but we'll just quickly go over it, and then I'll hand it back to Casey to talk more about the brain. Essentially, what we need to know is a lot of what we've already talked about. Trauma is very complex. It occurs in, in all different areas of our lives and affects all different areas of our lives. Um, it can definitely create these secondary adversities, like you've experienced tra trauma in the home and now you've been removed from your home, which is a second trauma, right? You, you've lost that relationship. Um, everybody reacts differently to trauma and loss, and um, the way that caregivers respond affects the way that people deal with their trauma. So when we were talking about attachment earlier, or we're even thinking about a child being placed in out-of-home care, sort of how they're being treated and how those caregivers are reacting affects this as well. We know that protective and promotive factors can greatly reduce the impact of trauma when they're already in place when a trauma happens and also when they're taught afterwards and um, when people have those relationships that are important. All of you guys are so important in young people's lives that you're working with. Um, consistency in relationship. There are studies that show just young people having one person who sticks with them throughout life can make a major difference in their entire life in the way that they um, view their own success and the way that maybe society views their success as well. We also know that culture is closely interwoven and this means so much more than what country of origin you're from, right? It might mean what neighborhood you live in or even what street you live on can affect the way that trauma is. And it's also really important to understand as providers that this is very, very challenging work and can evoke stress responses in ourselves. And so it's really important for us to be aware of that and to take measures to provide self-care to yourself um, or to your team and to encourage that. Because I have, we, we do entire trainings on vicarious trauma and self-care as well. Um, I have burned out of jobs before. I don't know if you have, maybe some of you have. But we have a problem in social services where we're doing good work, so we're encouraged to keep doing it. We're, we're encouraged to be workaholics and we're encouraged to like, dig in there and, and just keep working and not take care of ourselves. And if we don't have ourselves being filled up, then we are not, we're doing harm actually. Um, we are not doing good for the young people that we're working with. So that's extremely important. But again, if you don't have that handout, we, I would be happy to email it to you. I believe on that front sheet of the handouts, or if you don't have one at all, we can get our card and we'll email it to you. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about the brain and the fight, flight, or freeze. The amygdala is our alarm system. That's what triggers the fight, flight, or freeze. That's what, um, you know, again, when something happens, you have a response, um, a car pulls out in front of you, you almost hit them. You automatically, your body responds, right? Maybe your hands sweat, you have shortened breath, your heart's beating faster, um, any number of things. So when something happens, 
then the hippocampus is our librarian. That's the organization of thoughts and memory. So when Dr. Campbell was you know, showing you the desk and the sticky notes all over the desk, when you are having to fight for your life or what your brain perceives as fight for your life, where you left your car keys does not matter. What you have to do for homework is not important. What you're going to have for dinner doesn't matter. None of that matters because your brain says you have to stay alert because you never know what's coming next. So young people who aren't listening to you because they're scanning the room, they're looking behind them, it could be that they're easily distracted, they might have ADHD, it's possible. But what's also possible is that they're looking to see who's behind them because their brain tells them that's important. They're not sitting there thinking, how can I be the most annoying version of myself today? That's not their thought. Their brain, this organism in our heads is saying, be aware, be alert, watch what's going on around you. You have to know what everyone else is going to do so you know how to respond and protect yourself. So again, nothing else sticks when the brain is in survival mode. Now can we eventually get a young person to a place where they're not in survival mode all the time? Absolutely but it takes work. Um, the way neural pathways develop is repetition. It's like river running over rock. It's constant. So we can change that path, but it's gonna require just as much work on our end. That's why consistency and genuineness is so incredibly important when working with young people. If we say two o'clock on Tuesday, it needs to be two o'clock on Tuesday. And we need to let them know probably repeat ourselves several times, like I won't see you next week, remember I won't see you next week, and they'll say, I know, you told me, oh, God, I'm not stupid. And then two weeks later, when they're like, where were you last week, right? I told you I wasn't gonna be here. So understanding why that happens, that it's the brain, it's just not capturing um, what we think is important information, but the brain says it's not important because it's not literally life or death. Also understanding, helping a young person understand their brain and saying, you know, I've worked with other young people before, I don't know if this is you, but they had some bad things happen and their brain got a little wonky. And say, you know, they had a hard time remembering things, they had a hard time paying attention, or, you know, just normalizing those behaviors. Because when you tell a person, oh my gosh, if you didn't respond that way, I'd be worried about you after what you've been through. Um, normalizing that and helping them understand that can really make such a difference because, again, they, they won't feel like they're going crazy. And teenagers are very egocentric anyway. The world's all about me. You know, I have a, a zit on my forehead. Everyone in the school looked at my forehead today, right? We know that didn't happen. They felt like it happened. So when they think I'm having all of these things going on inside my head, everyone must know how crazy I am. When people aren't even realizing all the struggles that are happening for that young person. So helping them to normalize that and say, yeah, those, those struggles are perfectly normal and it's, it's part of your healing. It's part of the path that you're walking to um, a better you. Helping them understand that can really take some of the weight off them and help them feel a little more nor normal. Um, laziness. We see, I've heard many, many times, oh, that young person just doesn't want to. They could if they wanted to, but they don't really want to. And you know what? Their brain doesn't want to because is it going to mean I stay alive today if I do this? No? Okay, it's not important. So it's really about motivation. What can we find that the young person is interested in whether it's extracurricular activities, whether it's a certain subject, whether it's um, you know, hot Cheetos. You know, what, what are they interested in? What can we build a relationship around? What can we encourage them to achieve that they already have an interest in? Um, again, lying for young people who've experienced complex trauma, especially if it started at a young age, especially if it was sexual abuse and they couldn't leave that situation. To them, lying is survival. So you could walk in this room and say, um, what color is the carpet? The, the carpet's red? No, it's, it's yellow. And they think, okay, that, there's no reason not to be honest about what color the carpet is. But for them, it's self-protection. If you're asking me that, what do you really mean? Like they're trying to read between the lines. Um, so it becomes about survival for them. 
The same thing with manipulation. There's always something underlying the manipulation. So when we say, oh, that child is so manipulative, okay? They're using manipulation as a tactic to achieve what? Like they said in the video, what is the behavior telling me? Because it's working, or they wouldn't be doing, so what is it that they're trying to achieve? Are they afraid of something? Are they ashamed about something? Is there a need that they're trying to get met that they don't know how to be honest and say, I need someone to help me? Asking for help can be incredibly difficult for young people because they've had to be independent. They know if I don't do it for myself, it's not gonna get done. Or sometimes if they're involved in the system and the way the system works and is so slow in responding, they think it's never gonna happen. I need to do it for myself. Um, so recognize when you hear that word manipulation, okay, what, what's the, the need underlying what people would call manipulation? And again, focus on where the brain is. Focus on what the young person is able to accomplish where they are. You might have a 15-year-old that's more at a 12-year-old level. Are they a, a successful 12-year-old brain? They're doing some things really well? That's great. Praise those successes, focus on that, and, and don't get so caught up in, but yes, but they should be here. Yeah, they should be, but let's focus on where they are now and learn how to equip them where they are now. So um, we have a short video from Dr. Siegel who's going to talk a little bit about the brain, and he's going to use the downstairs brain and the upstairs brain. He's going to use his hand. So the downstairs brain is the amygdala. The upstairs brain is what we call the prefrontal cortex here, and that's what um, is not yet developed in teenagers. So when we ask why, they don't know why. Um, because this, this hasn't fully developed yet in young people. And here's your nine functions. You have this in your handout. In the interest of time, we won't go through it. But what I do want to point out, um, what he says in that video, is relationship. So we can't teach young people anything about how to manage their trauma responses until we've worked really hard to build that relationship. Everybody's heard of a trigger, correct? We all know what this is. So obviously it's something that happens that reminds us of something else and we have an automatic reaction. It can really be anything. Um, a lot of times we think about triggers around Fourth of July with fireworks and veterans, um, but this really can be anything. And it's important for us to remember that too because we might not always see or hear what the trigger is. It might be a smell, it might be the, the look of somebody. Because I've heard staff at residential placements say, like, nothing happened, and this kid just freaked out for no reason. Well, something happened, we just don't know what it is, right? So it's important for us to remember that. There's symptoms of trauma um, that affect all parts of our body and our brains. So these are just some ways that things might happen to the body when a trauma is happening, and then over time we might see a lot of somatic responses to trauma. Same thing with the mind. We might become more forgetful. We might become really lost in our own selves, become really overwhelmed. Casey's already talked about a lot of this, so I'm going quickly because we want to get to all the trauma-informed care as well. We also know that this can change our worldview. It can make us believe that there's nobody out there that cares about us. Um, there's no sense of justice in the world. Um, there's no person that is trustworthy, this again is all stuff we've already talked about. So being trauma informed suggests that when we're working with people that we're aware as much as we possibly could be about potential triggers in their life and have a plan in place to deal with that. So we are recognizing either because they've told us, because we've asked, or because of our own experience, what might be a trigger in somebody's life, and then what might be helpful, and not only what might be helpful to help them calm down, but also what could be harmful and make it worse so that we don't do those things. And this is very individualized, right? One person might say, hey, if I start giggling excessively, that means stuff's about to go down, right? And what I really need is for somebody to put their hand on my shoulder, for me to feel grounded, and the person standing right next to them says, go ahead and try to touch me when I'm being triggered, right? You need to know whether that's gonna be helpful or harmful. SAMHSA's definition of trauma-informed care includes three elements, 
realizing the prevalence of trauma, recognizing how it affects everybody, including ourselves, and responding by putting that into practice, trauma-informed care is not a treatment modality. It is a concept that allows people to feel safe, feel accepted, and feel understood. So what we are doing is we're sort of switching the way that we're thinking, right? Instead of saying, what is wrong with you? We're saying, what happened? And I can give you guys another, I like to give silly examples, you may have noticed. Um, another silly example of, of something that happened in my own home. Several years ago, my little kid, what, we were leaving in the morning. Mornings are always a little stressful. Um, to my knowledge, she doesn't have a trauma history, um, but we were leaving and we got to the door of the garage and he lost his mind, right? Like on the ground, screaming, crying, we were gonna get in the car. And I could have responded by being like, what's wrong with you, just get in the car, right? Like nothing happened. But for whatever reason that morning, I had my head on straight and I was like, hey buddy, what, mama missed something, like what happened here? And he, like, through his tears, was like, I didn't eat breakfast. Oh my gosh, your mom forgot to feed you, right? Let's go get some food. Um, but I could have made that situation so much worse by being, what, what's wrong with you? Nothing happened, right? Something happened. I wasn't aware of it. Clearly, I had forgotten to feed my child. <laughs> These things happen, right? Um, it's important. <laughs> He's well taken care of, I promise you. <laughs> um, so... Anyways, we, we want to be thinking about what are some of the guiding principles of trauma-informed care. Safety is a huge one. And it's not just is somebody physically safe. Because what we've been talking about all morning is that kids sometimes are physically safe, but they don't feel safe. right? They are physically safe in their placement, but they're constantly in that survival brain because they don't feel safe. Because they don't know what's going to be happening. And so it's important to recognize both physical and emotional safety as a guiding principle of trauma-informed care, as well as trustworthiness. Again, we've been talking about this. It should all be tying together. It's really important to recognize that we have to earn the trust of the individuals that we work with. It doesn't come automatically. We know we're trustworthy, hopefully, um, but that doesn't mean that other people do. And so how do we earn trustworthiness? How do we earn that trust? We admit when we make mistakes. We apologize when we make mistakes. That goes a really long way. Kids can sometimes be so overwhelmed by the fact that you just admitted you did something wrong that it really opens up the gates for, for trust. We definitely don't want to promise things we can't deliver. We really want to be genuine and transparent. We want to have good boundaries. We want to know what our role is and stay in our lane. That can be very, very hard to do. But when we don't do that, when we have poor boundaries, when we do things that we shouldn't be doing because of our role, um, it can be very confusing and cause a lot of problems in the long run. We also want to recognize choice and collaboration as an important principle of trauma-informed care. What can an individual make a choice about in their life? Sometimes they don't have a lot of choices in their life. They don't choose who they're living with necessarily. They don't choose where they're living. They don't choose whether or not they get to go to school. What can they choose? And allowing young people to have as many choices as possible. And then how can we collaborate with them? What is a way that we can meet them where they're at, that we can be sort of consultive rather than an authority figure in their life. Uh, most young people are surrounded by authority figures and having somebody who's coming alongside them to say, you have a lot of expertise in your own life. How can I help you meet your goals can be really, really helpful. Something I want to mention is that trauma-informed care is inconvenient, right? Um, it is, it takes time. It takes effort, it takes us checking our own emotions and not getting frustrated. It, takes, it puts a lot of pressure on us, not the individual, which is how it should be, right? When we're working with somebody who's experienced trauma, we wanna make sure that we're making things as easy as we possibly can for them. We want to recognize their abilities, empower them to use their skills. What are things we can do to encourage young people? How do we recognize successes? What are successes in our mind? Are they the same things that young people are recognizing as successes? And then how do we celebrate those things? A lot of times we focus entirely on education, right? Are you gonna finish high school? Are you gonna go to college? Is that the only success somebody can have in their life? Absolutely not. We can celebrate small successes all the time. 
And then cultural competency. Casey was just telling me earlier that this is a, a verb, right? We, think about, we want to think about this as a verb. This is constant learning about other people's cultures. This is not, do I speak the language of the individual that I'm serving? It is that, but it's so much more than that, right? It is, do I understand the culture that this child grew up in? Do I understand the neighborhood? I spent a lot of years living in the city of Chicago, and I can tell you that from one street to another street is a different culture. And it might not be that way in the communities that you live in, but we have to think about these things, right? You might live in the same town, but come from a totally different world than the young person that you're serving. And another example I want to give you guys is a few years ago, we had a young person who had run away and was staying in contact with her providers. And we asked if she would be willing to get on a conference call. How many of you guys have been on a conference call before? I would assume everybody in the room has been on a conference call. How many teenagers do you think have been on conference calls? So this was not something that occurred to me, right? I should have thought, this child does not know what a conference call is. Let me do some education before we get this kid on the call. But, but because I didn't think that way, this is what not to do, right? She was like, does, is GPS going to be able to find me if I call into this? And then she finally called it and was like, what's that noise? What's that noise? What's that? Who's there? Who's there? Lots of stress was caused because the office culture that we're all used to and the professional culture is not youth culture, right? So that's another thing we need to pay attention to. Adult culture and youth culture is very different. Even if we just think about, um, again, we do a lot of internet safety training. If you just think about what it was like to grow up when you were a teenager compared to what it's like to grow up in today's world with so much social connectedness, we have no idea what it's like to be a teenager today. And we have to admit that, right? Let them teach us. <clears throat> so these are all things that we want to really be aware of when we are thinking about trauma-informed care. And Casey already talked quite a bit about this, but it's, it's really important to Try not to label young people with these negative things like they're manipulative and lazy. Um, it's easy to do that because that's how it presents, but we want to recognize that they have coping skills in place that we may think are maladaptive, but they're working for them and they wouldn't be doing it, right? People are doing the best they can. They're, they're, nobody's goal in life is to fail. People are really doing the best they can with what they have. Also recognizing that sometimes those maladaptive coping mechanisms are, I mean, they're, they're working. And if we take those things away and don't give them other skills, we're really doing them a disservice. Of course, neither of us are gonna say we want kids to use drugs or cut themselves. Of course not, right? Um, but even with the ACEs study, I know a lot of you raised your hand and saying you have an understanding of what that is. You all know how that sort of started, right? Like why they started asking those questions because they were doing weight loss programs and smoking cessation programs, and they were having great success, and then within a couple of weeks, people were gaining all their weight back or going back to a different vice, because the problem wasn't the vice, that was the coping mechanism, right? So they were, they were seeing success with people losing weight or stopping smoking, but then they weren't dealing with what it was that was causing somebody to overeat or to smoke, right? And so, they went right back to what worked for them. And so if we're not able to help somebody connect them to the resource to get the proper therapy, to get the proper healing, to, to do the, the work to sort of rewire the brain, um, then we can't just say, hey, you know cutting's bad for you. You know doing drugs is bad for you. <laughs> you, you think? Yeah, I know that. <laughs> That's not helpful, though. How can you help me do something else instead? So those poor coping mechanisms have kept people alive, and so we want to recognize that. A couple other things, and then we, we can open it for discussion. We know that somebody has kept themselves alive without us, right? We, are, we, we can't think of ourselves as coming in as a savior to save somebody's life. We really have to give credit to the young person themselves for keeping themselves alive and, and doing the things that they have to get to the point where they are today. We also want to make sure that we're respecting choice, always. That is really hard to do sometimes because We've discussed about how the brain isn't fully formed and young people don't always make the decisions that we would make for them. See how I said that? Not that they made bad choices, <laughs> but they made decisions that maybe we wouldn't have made for them if we were making decisions for them. 
But that's how we learn too, right? I'm sure all of us have made a bad decision in our life and learned from it. But we, most of us probably had an environment that we were able to do that and it didn't cause us extreme harm in the long run because we were able to go back and, and talk through it with our caregivers and learn from it. We also know that people who are in pain need to be treated with kindness. This again is sort of, it's not groundbreaking information, right? Um, but it's important for us to remember that. We also want to remember that people change slowly. So ambivalence is actually a good thing. When somebody makes a really, really fast decision without thinking through it, we don't always think that's a good idea, right? Because it's probably not going to stick unless as a caregiver, as an adult, we think, oh, they've made the choice that I wanted them to make. Then we celebrate it. <laughs> um, so it's really important to, to, to have, are you guys all familiar with the stages of change and how people move through change? Okay, I'm not going to get into that today, but basically we don't go from not knowing there's a problem at all to sort of making a major life change and maintaining that for the rest of our life. We go through steps, right? And so if we want somebody to go from here to here, our, our goal would be to get them just to the next step, to even think about whether there's something in their life they want to change. So thinking through it is actually a good thing. Again, we want to be consultive, not necessarily an authority figure. And engaging with somebody is actually the work. We also know that people who are compliant are easier to work with. And how do people become compliant? By feeling safe, feeling accepted, feeling understood, right? And then the, the, the final point here is we really want to remember that individuals are experts of their own lives. We do not know what it is like to be them. They do not know what it's like to be us. We may have a lot of information about what resources are out there to be able to connect people to services, to be able to, to recall former individuals we've served and, and make parallels, but we do not know what it's like to be them. And so we really want to remember that and allow them to be the expert in their own life. And that goes for, for how many of you guys are working with parents of young people as well, or interacting with parents? That goes for that too. I mean, we, we sometimes forget because a parent maybe has caused harm or not protected a child from harm, um, we forget that they still are experts on their own child's life, and we, we want to make sure we're giving them voice. And that's a whole different conversation about trauma-informed care with, <laughs> with parents. But um, that, that kind of brings us to the, the end of the discussion this morning. Does anybody have any specific questions? Yes. Yeah. I mean, it could be both, right? So it's definitely happening during the event, but then because our brains can't always discriminate between something that's actually happening and maybe a memory, then it could also be happening when somebody is being questioned. And, and it's good for all of us to know that, right? Because we're curious about what's happened to somebody. And so we may ask questions too. But again, knowing our role, what do we really need to know? Do we really need to know the nitty gritty details of somebody's trauma? Most of us don't. And so we need to remember what our role is and, and, and remember not to ask those questions if we don't have to. There was another hand? Yeah. You've had some borderline personality clients? <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing, a, a treatment modality that's been proven to work really well is dialectical behavior therapy. 
and it's been successful with individuals with borderline personality traits or borderline personality disorders. So a lot with borderline personality is that attachment, that relationship piece, and it really teaches them skills on how to manage those emotions that they don't understand, how to manage relationships, how to set up boundaries for themselves. So um, a therapist can learn particular skills, and we have a therapist who works with adults, and she does a lot of DBT skill building for these individuals because it, it teaches them how to essentially understand what's going on emotionally within themselves and learning how to manage that. So it's not a lost cause. Um, it, it takes time and it is difficult, but it, it certainly um, has responded to treatment. They have you know studies that have shown that. So it. Well, an, an individual has to want to participate, and that's part of the stages of change. If they think everything's fine, I don't have a problem, you just meet them where they are and say, okay, what's something you do want to work on and go from there? Um, because part of building that relationship will help lead them to say, well, maybe I want to do something differently. It's really important, too, for us to have really good, clear boundaries and consistent boundaries and to say, I'm not available after 5 p.m. You're welcome to leave me a message and I'll call you back the next day. Um, because they're definitely gonna call after 5 p.m. and leave you 700,000 messages. Um, and then you call them back the next day. And you know, just that's, that's really important, uh, our responsibility in working with those individuals. And, and something Casey just said I wanna reiterate, it's really important to recognize what the individual's goals are. Because we may have goals for them that may not be the goals they have for themselves, and therein lies discord, right? So really meeting somebody where they're at and finding out what they want to work on might lead to them eventually wanting to work on what you think they need to work on. Maybe not, but it's, it's, it's just going to be a lot less frustrating for you as a provider and them as somebody receiving services if you're able to sort of really meet and work on the goal that the individual themselves wants to work on. Any other questions? Um. <laughs> I, I mean, I think just saying that, saying, you know, I don't, you know, depending on how much of the child's history that you know, um, even saying, um, I don't know much about their history or I'm just wondering, has that been considered? Have you thought about? Um, I heard this. What do you think? Um, a lot of the things we do with the young people we're working with, you know, what do you think about this? Like, and, and they may completely dismiss it and, you know, you just operate from your area and considering trauma and understanding and um, advocating the best you can. Um, but I would start with that just inquisitive, you know, have you thought about, have you considered? I think you can also ask sort of what assessments are being used in an evaluation to see if trauma is being assessed for, trauma symptoms are being assessed for. There's a lot of really good evidence-based psychological assessments out there. I don't think you can assume that a therapist is going to be addressing trauma. I'd love to say that all therapists should have training in trauma and understand that, but it's just not necessarily it, the case. It also depends on if the, the individual wants to. We've, um, even at the Vieira campus, we've had kids say, yeah, I know that happened, I'm not talking about it. They'll talk about everything else and they'll work on everything else, but you get to this and they'll tell you, no, I'm not. And so you can't, um, you can't make them. So, All, all therapy should be trauma-informed. There are specific modalities. There's like trauma-focused cognitive behavior therapy. Um, some therapists have specific training in that. But I always tell people, especially working with survivors of exploitation, if they have a really good understanding of attachment and trauma, then they should be competent therapists. Um, it's more about us understanding the behaviors and the impacts than making them work on their trauma. 
Uh, because if we can understand what motivates those behaviors, we're going to respond very differently than if we think they're just a bad kid or they're just, they just don't want to. It's, you know, again, you ask Manny, why did you punch that kid? I don't know. I had to do something. Um, what it shows at the end of that video is a therapist who says, when someone has experienced what you've experienced, they react that way. So let's figure it out. Um, that's really what you want the therapist to say, not I'm the expert, I know how to treat trauma, it's let's figure it out as much as the individual is willing to go, as far as they're willing to go. And again, stages of change over time, hopefully the young person is willing to say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to talk about that. And I think as advocates as well, it's an important to recognize that the, the therapist might be trauma-informed, understand trauma, and the individual themselves is not willing to go there, and it doesn't mean they need a new therapist necessarily, right? Um, because a lot of times we refer kids to treatment programs and we're like, well, they've been there six months, they should be healed by now, right? That's what, that's what insurance says. Um, and that's just not how it works. And even if somebody does successfully complete a program in treatment, then they go through adolescence or they have some other major life change and these trauma symptoms are gonna resurface in a new way and they may need a different type of therapy at that point in their life. I mean, this, this doesn't ever go away. You can't expect somebody who's experienced trauma to ever be somebody who has never experienced trauma, right? It's, it will keep resurfacing when, when life changes are happening. So, yeah. One more. Sure. I think that's challenging because there, there are sometimes symptoms that medication can help manage while the child works on trauma, and so it can be beneficial. Again, I think I would just ask, you know, what, do you, what part do you think trauma is playing in this? And when they're, they're prescribed a medication, even ask the young person, why, why are you taking this? What's it for? Um, because that young person should know what meds are taking and what its purpose is and what it's helping them do. Um, so they can say, yeah, it's not working, what it's supposed to be doing. So I think just asking the questions, just trying to figure it out. And, and you know, ask the professional, what are your thoughts around it? Do you think trauma is, you know, influencing this? Or, or you know, how, how do you think it's the best way to go about this? All right, I think you guys have a snack before your next. <laughs> Session. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much.